Good day everyone and welcome to the first webinar of the uh, month-long series which we are going to have by the fellows and the IEEE fellows of the Electron Device Society. And this webinar series which the IEEE Electron Device Society Delhi Chapter, New Delhi, India is organizing is part of a bigger program that is the celebration of the 75th anniversary of the transistor invention. And this whole series and the program is supported by the Department of Biotechnology's uh, Star College scheme at the India Alupadhyay College, University of Delhi. And also along with the National Academy of Sciences, India, Delhi chapter, the NASI, that is the National Academy of Sciences, India is the oldest science academy of India established in 1932. Today we have with us Professor Uda, who is a Professor Emeritus and IEEE Life Fellow, an adjunct professor, Department of Electrical, Electronic and Information Engineering at University of Lola. And he'll be talking to us on physical modeling and numerical analysis driven by the evolution of semiconductor technology. He's a well-known figure in Electron Device Society and has received a degree in electrical engineering in 1973 and a degree in physics in 1976, both from the University of Bologna, Italy. His research interests are in the field of physics of carrier transport and numerical analysis of semiconductor devices and solid state sensors. In 1986, he became a visiting scientist on a one-year assignment at the IBM Thomson J. Watson Research Center at New York, studying the discretization techniques for the Boltzmann transport equation. In 1990, he became full professor of electronics and in 2021, professor emeritus at the University of Bologna. An IEEE Life Fellow and a recipient of the 1998 Kroeber Foundation Award he has coordinated several research projects funded by the European Commission, international companies and foundations, the National Council of Research and the National Ministry of University and Research. He has authored about 350 papers in international journals or proceedings of international conferences in the field of physical modeling and numerical analysis of solid state devices. He is author or co-author or editor of 14 books and is one of the founders of the Advanced Research Center for Electronic Systems founded in 2001 at the University of Bologna. With these words, I now invite Professor Udan to kindly share his screen to deliver his talk. Is it visible? Absolutely, sir. Okay, Please thank go. you, Professor Saxena. And good day, everyone. It is an honor and a privilege to be invited to deliver this talk. And uh, I will briefly give uh, the outline of it. <clears throat> uh, after a very, very short uh, introduction to the lambda element models, uh, I will talk about the model based on the differential equations, in particular the diffusion with some examples. Then go to a higher level model that is the hydrodynamic one. And then the, some description of the semical semi-classical Boltzmann equation and some types of methods that are used for the solution of it. And I will conclude with a brief description of methods that go beyond the Boltzmann transport equation. Uh, very likely many seminars of this type has cited Moore's law. In essence, in the last uh, six decades, the uh, number of components per chip has increased exponentially. At the, at the same time, the size of the components has decreased 
exponentially and in parallel to it, the cost of the individual component has also decreased exponentially with respect to the cost of what could be the individual transistors cost in 1960. And uh, in order to better understand this, it is convenient to quote uh, some sentences from uh, a chapter of a book that was published a few weeks ago that comments about Moore's law saying that uh, in essence, the cost of the manufacture of a microprocessor, that is the cost of a square centimeter of a chip did not change significantly for many, many years. That means that uh, the miniaturization makes it possible to incorporate into the single chip more and more functional units in the same cost. And uh, if we make a comparison of what the cost could be of a supercomputer of the 70, a very famous example of it was the Cray computer that may cost some millions of dollars. And now we can put uh, in uh, a single chip at least as much computing power as that of a Cray for a much, much smaller cost. Uh, this means that we need a very clever and accurate method for designing chips. And uh, clearly this cannot be done by trial and error. This is heavily done using the so-called technology computer aided design that is designing by computer simulation. Uh, it is estimated that uh, using TCAD provides about 40% reduction in the development cost. I'm quoting again a chapter of that recent book. Uh, the easiest form of modeling is the so-called analytical model. We start from the equations describing the semiconductor devices after some simplifications that may be rather heavy, we end up with analytical expressions connecting the current or the currents and the voltages of the device. An example is given here for the PN junction. Those who are experts of it know that uh, there is another term that is missing, that is the recombination current. And also they know that uh, the parameters of this equation, that is the inverse thermal voltage beta and the saturation current IS depend on temperature. And they also depend on other things that are important, okay? So the incorporation of the dependencies in the coefficients is not always so easy for the so-called lumped element models like this one. If we have um, dynamic situations, we must add capacitances to the circuit. A similar description can be given for the bipolar transistor that is visible in this slide. Another similar description is possible for the MOS transistor. In that case, one can incorporate uh, some dependencies. For instance, the degradation of mobility produced by the normal field uh, to, the, to the interface, but that is not, not so easy. So we must go to the numerical solution, the direct numerical solution of the equations governing the functioning of the devices and the uh, first level type of model is the drift diffusion model in which uh, for the case of the electrons of the conduction band of a semiconductor, we have two equations. On the left, uh, we have the continuity equation that essentially states that the variation of the particles in a volume um, with respect to time is equal to the flux 
of the particles across the boundary of the volume. And in this case, we have an additional term that is expressed by Wn that describes the phenomenon of creation or destruction of particles. Uh, this is present because in, in essence, we have two classes of particles in a semiconductor, electrons and holes, and uh, there could be an exchange between the two classes of particles. On the right, uh, we have the equation describing the current density. And this is the um, so-called diffusion transport equation, in this case for the electrons. And uh, one term of it is uh, uh, quite obvious, okay? Because it states that uh, the uh, contribution to the current is proportional to the electric field. So if we combine the coefficients together, we recognize that the coefficients essentially provide the conductivity associated to the electrons. However, in a semiconductor, we have another term that is the diffusive term. And this diffusive term is present because in contrast to what happens in metals, in which the concentration of the electrons is, is uniform, in semiconductors, due to the uh, strong variation in space of the dopant concentration, we have a gradient of the concentration of the carriers that is non-negligible. A similar situation is present for the holes. We shall see it in the next slide. If we are in a steady state situation, we simply neglect the uh, time derivative of the carriers. For the holes, we have two similar equations. And then we must describe the electric potential and the electric field. So we have two more equations. The one on the left uh, is essentially the first Maxwell equation stating that the divergence of the displacement vector is equal to the charge density. And for the semiconductor, the charge density is equal to the contribution of the holes, that is the small p, minus the electrons, that is the small n, plus the net, the open concentration that is the capital N. Uh, as for the electric field, we describe the electric field as minus the gradient of the electric potential. This is incomplete because in general, there should be also the time derivative of the vector potential. However, semiconductor devices are so small that the propagation of the electromagnetic perturbation in them can be assumed to be practically instantaneous. So the uh, electric field and the electric potential are at each instant uh, in consistent with the boundary condition. So we don't have propagation, we neglect the <coughs> contribution of the magnetic potential. Now, if we put all these things together, we have two sets of equations. Those on the left are equations in divergence form in which there is the divergence of some vector that is the current density for electrons, holes, or the electric field. On the right, we have three more equations that describe the form of such vectors. So the colors indicate in blue the vectors, in red the scalar unknowns, NP and the electric potential phi, and also other quantities like WN and WP that depend on the concentrations. So we have a set of six equations uh, to solve. All these equations are the, all the, of the first order in space because there are only the first derivatives. And if we are in a dynamic situation, they are of the first order also with respect to time. Are they linear? Unfortunately, they are not linear. If you look at the two circles on the right, you see immediately the products of the electric field 
that is an unknown times a concentration that is another unknown. So this is a non-linearity. In the two circles on the left, we also have the uh, recombination, the ge generation recombination terms that depend non-linearly on the concentrations. More dependencies are present, for instance, in the diffusion coefficients dn and dp on the right. So the equations are nonlinear and they are coupled because each of these equations contains more than one unknown. Uh, the first step for the solution of them is the elimination. This is the indication of nonlinearities, is the elimination of the vectors. And this can be done rather easily. I am giving an example here. We simply take the couple of equations, including the first Maxwell equation and the definition of the electric field, and we put them together by inserting the vector from the right into the left equation. We end up with a single equation in which there are only scalar unknowns, phi, p, and n. And the same we can do for the two equations describing the currents. However, the equation becomes of the second order. So we reduce the system from six equations of the first order to three equations of the second order. But this is the standard situation and it is very convenient because the unknowns are only scalar quantities. Since the equations are nonlinear and non-separable, we must tackle them by means of a, an iteration scheme. So a possible iteration scheme is called the decoupled scheme in which we prescribe two of the three unknowns, for instance, the concentrations and solve the equation for phi. Then using phi, we solve the equation for n, then we solve the equation for p, and after obtaining a new form of the three unknowns, we keep iterating, starting from scratch again, until hopefully we reach convergence. Convergence is reached when the difference in norm between the old and the new form of the unknowns is smaller than uh, some little number. The other scheme is the so-called coupled scheme in which we prescribe together a tentative form of all unknowns, hoping that they are close enough to the true ones. Then we linearize the equations and solve them. And then we again iterate on this. If this method converges, near convergence, we gain two digits per iteration, so it is more effective. Instead, in the decoupled scheme, we gain only one digit per iteration. So the question is, which is preferable? And this is visible in the following table, in which the advantages or disadvantages of the two methods are compared. The decoupled scheme has a lower numerical cost, and if the tentative solution is far from the actual one, it is more easily it is more easy to drive, so to speak, the uh, solution towards convergence. Instead, an advantage of the coupled scheme is that uh, near convergence, it goes quicker to convergence because it uh, acquires two digits per iteration. This is essentially due to the fact that uh, we calculate the derivatives. So if you remember the, Newton's, the Newton method for solving a numerical equation, you find that uh, you need the calculation of the function and of the derivative, so you gain two digits because you make two calculations essentially. In essence, what people do is starting with the, the decouple method, using the decouple method that is cheaper 
to go as close as possible to the solution and then convert to the coupled method in order to complete the procedure. An example in one dimension of the standard numerical method that is used for solving this equation is uh, described here with a reference to the uh, Poisson equation. So uh, we take a segment over which we want to solve the equation. We assume that uh, at the two ends of the segment, the boundary conditions are prescribed. And then we distribute some points that are the black dots along the segment. And we want to calculate the electric potential at nodes from one to N. The uh, segment between two consecutive nodes is called element. And the midpoint of the element uh, is the yellow dot. Two of them are shown in the figure. The segment between two yellow dots is called a cell. So what we do is we want to solve the Poisson equation. We start from the first Maxwell equation in one dimension. We integrate it over a cell that is between two yellow dots. This is similar to applying the Gauss theorem. So we obtain that uh, the electric field on the right yellow dot minus the electric field on the left yellow dot is equal to the integral of the charge density. The latter is approximated with the value at the node K that is in between the two yellow dots times the length of the cell. Then we take the other equation relating the field to the potential and assume that the potential is piecewise linear. That is, it mm, is a, approximated with the linear function over each element. Thanks to this, we can calculate E minus as the differential quotient. We calculate E plus as the other differential quotient, and then we replace this into the first equation. In this way, we have eliminated the field. You remember that was the initial strategy for solving the equations. And we have a relation that involves only the values of the electric potential. If we repeat the procedure at each node from one to N, we obtain an algebraic system in which there are N equations, N unknowns, and we incorporate automatically the boundary conditions from the left and from the right. This is easily extended to several dimensions because we simply keep the concept that the electric field is a constant over each element. The electric potential is linear over each element and the electric potential must be uniquely identified by its values at the elements node. So this naturally leads to the choice of simplexes as element. In other terms, if we use a two-dimensional grid, this method is applicable if we adopt triangles as elements. If we use a three-dimensional solution, we must select tetrahedra in three dimensions. A two-dimensional example follows. The blue triangle is one of the elements. The red uh, polygon is the cell. The cell here corresponds to the segment between the yellow dots in the one-dimensional case. We apply the Gauss theorem on the cell by taking the nodal value of the charge density and multiplying it by the area of the cell. And then we calculate the flux of the electric field across the boundary of the cell. So this is a method that uh, due to the form 
of the domain is called the box integration method and is the most popular approach to the solution of the semiconductor equations uh, that is used worldwide. Uh, of course, we do the same for the current densities and the continuity equations for the electrons and holes. Examples. In the lower um, left part of the figure, you see how to construct uh, a triangular grid in two dimensions, starting from rectangles. This is useful because on one side, we can um, build up a grid with very different sizes of the elements. On the other side, we avoid obtuse angles. Obtuse angles are not so good numerically, so must be avoided. The grid must be, of course, very dense, where we expect that the quantities like concentrations of the electrons and holes change much. On the other hand, the grid must be coarse in the regions where the semiconductor is almost uniform. In three dimensions, we replicate a two-dimensional grid on many planes, like in the uh, figure on the right. By way of example, I'm going to show a simulation of the of the um, EEPROM cell, actually two EEPROM cells near to the other. Uh, the cells have an N channel. 12 nanometers of oxide thickness. Uh, they are asymmetric. The junction depth of the source is larger than that of the drain. The grid amounts to a total of 50,000 nodes. And the simulation was performed by using the in-house program HVILS that was mm, built up at the University of Bologna. This is the example of the grid. What is the problem for the EEPROM cell? The problem is that uh, we have actually two transistors side by side uh, that are controlled by the same gate contact as you see on the upper left part of the figure. If we ground the drain of transistor T2, we expect uh, that uh, transistor T2 will not carry any current, whereas we can operate transistor uh, T1, okay? However, if you look uh, at the right part of the figure, the two color figures A and B, uh, they are, uh, they represent the two, the two transistors side by side. The red part is the drain of uh, T1. And the missing part is the place where the sewers of T1 would be. Uh, if the gate voltage is small, then you may see that the green part of the domain here, that the colors indicate the voltage, okay? Underneath the thick part of the oxide, that is the gray region here, the voltage is small. So there is no possibility for an inversion layer to build up in this situation. However, if we increase the gate voltage, now you should look at the lower figure, figure B, you see there is a green area underneath the gate. That means that the channel is inverted also under transistor T2 that should not be functioning. Because of that, there will be some parasitic current flowing from the transistor T1 to transistor T2. So this was a simulation showing that the design should be changed. <clears throat> In the 80s, another problem became crucial. That was the description of the energy of the, of the electrons or the holes. It is important to describe such an energy because when the size of the devices become smaller and smaller, it may happen that the electric field in it, or for instance, along the channel of a MOS transistor becomes larger. 
the energy of the chiris becomes also larger and some chiris may be injected into the oxide because they, their energy is larger than that of the barrier between semiconductor and oxide. This feature is not described by the drift diffusion model because the drift diffusion model fixes the average energy of the carriers to the lattice energy. So we must uh, revisit the derivation of the drift diffusion model in order to be able to incorporate into the description also the energy of the carrier. The starting point is the Boltzmann equation that is visible in the first line. The Boltzmann equation has, besides the time dependence, has six independent variables that are the three space variables, R, and the three variables, K, that are the K vectors, the K vector. Uh, very often, uh, it is not important to describe the dependence on the k vector so an easy solution for that is integrating the equation over k and recovering an equation that depends only on space and possibly on time a better method is let's see what happens if we multiply both sides of the boltzmann equation by some function that depends on the wave vector and then integrate over the k space and this is shown in the next slide the equation on top is the original boltzmann equation if we multiply it by one and simply integrate over k we obtain directly the continuity equation of the electrons that appears in the drift diffusion model if we restart the procedure, but before integrating, we multiply the equation by the velocity u of the electrons, and then we integrate, we obtain the drift diffusion equation for the electrons. So we may continue in this way. We may, for instance, think of multiplying by u squared or equivalently, since u squared is proportional to the kinetic energy of the electron, we may multiply the equation by the kinetic energy and then integrate. The result of it is the, equa the continuity equation for the average energy of the electrons. If we continue, we may multiply by u cubed or equivalently by u times the energy. And this provides the continuity equation for the energy flux. And we can go as long as we wish, taking more and more uh, equations of this type. You may observe that uh, equations of even orders come from the multiplication by a scalar, one or u squared. So they are scalar equations. Equations of odd orders come from the multiplication by a vector, so they are vector equations. If we put these things together, we note that the moments of order 0 and 1 provide, as anticipated, the drift diffusion model. The moments of order 0, 1, 2, and 3 provide a more sophisticated model that is called hydrodynamic because of the analogy with the fluid dynamics. Uh, it is necessary always to use pairs of equation because you remember the need of transforming two first order equations into a single second order equation. No matter how many moments we select, the equations are always coupled to each other and the last one, the higher order moment, has also a moment of order n plus one in it that must be approximated somehow. This is called the closure condition. To date, the most sophisticated moments method use six moments. Examples of application. This is a description of uh, uh, the application of the hydrodynamic model 
to an MOS device uh, describing the transfer characteristics at different drain source voltages compared with experiments. So they compare neatly with experiments. This simulation is related to currents that are relatively high, but uh, a better perception of the power of the method is given by this figure in which uh, uh, the simulation regards the substrate currents of the transistor that are much, much smaller and much more difficult to describe. So again, the comparison between measurement and uh, hydrodynamic simulation is good. How much information do we get from the moments method? This is the idea that is that drives us to the next step in the device modeling. If we analyze the situation in one dimension, we can define the moment of order n of the distribution function as the integral of the distribution function times the nth power of k. Uh, this integral converges because f decays exponentially. Now there is a beautiful theorem that shows that uh, if you take the Fourier transform of the distribution function, you can express it as a series in which the coefficients are the moments of the distribution function itself. As a consequence, the knowledge of all moments provides the knowledge of the Fourier transform and by entire transforming provides the distribution function itself. Of course, the knowledge of some of the moments will provide a truncated Taylor series, so a partial information about uh, the distribution function. So if one wants to have a real complete information about uh, the <clears throat> uh, distribution function should solve the Boltzmann equation in full. One method for solving the uh, Boltzmann equation in spool is very famous, the Monte Carlo method. It is based on statistical sampling, but is very expensive because of this very strong cost of the Monte Carlo simulation. Typically it is run considering samples that are in steady state and uh, homogeneous in space in order to reduce the dimensionality of the problem. Another way of solving the Boltzmann transport equation is trying to reduce the dimensionality directly into the equation. And this can be done starting from this observation that uh, in free space, the relation between energy and k-vector is isotropic. That is, the energy depends only on the modulus of the k-vector. If we take the semiconductor, but we use the parabolic band approximation, after expressing the k-vector into spherical coordinates and integrating over the angles, we see again that uh, the relation is isotropic. So the idea is the following. We may try to use an isotropic form of the relation between energy and k-vector and reduce the dimensionality of the Boltzmann transport equation. This procedure is extremely powerful. It brings to a method that is called spherical harmonics expansion for the solution of the Boltzmann equation. And it has proved very, very important and fruitful, especially for the calculation of a number of properties. And uh, these properties are, of course, related to the high energies or high energy tail of the distribution that are the so-called hot carrier effects. So in the next few slides, I'm going to show a few examples of application of this method. This is for silicon, the, one of the uh, relevant aspects of the 
method is that we can use the full band structure of the semiconductor using actually the density of states that is visible for silicon in the left part of the figure and the group velocity that is shown in the right part of the figure. Uh, a cheaper solution could be based on an analytical approximation of the bands that is shown, for instance, by the green line in the figure. In any case, the analytical approximation must be good enough up to, for silicon, at least 3.1 electron volts, because that is the barrier between silicon and silicon dioxide. This is the first example that shows directly the distribution function as a function of energy up to five electron volts in the conduction band of silicon. Five electron volts is really enough for the types of description that are necessary, necessary in semiconductors. The dots come from a full Monte Carlo solution made with the code uh, of IBM that is called Damocles. And the color curves refer to the solution by the spherical harmonics expansion using the analytical bands, green line. The blue line is the full band situation, but no fitting of the scattering rate. And the red line that is quite good is using the fitting of the scattering rates. Similarly, we can describe mobility. These two figures refer to electrons and holes and are the modeling of mobility with respect to uh, the variation of temperature of the lattice and the variation of the dopant concentration up to very high values, as you see on the horizontal scale. The curves, again, are the simulations. The dots or diamonds or, uh, or triangles are uh, experiments for from different from different groups. Uh, other important parameters are the impact ionization coefficients. They can also be calculated with this method. In particular, the figure shows the impact ionization coefficients with respect to temperature as a function of the inverse uh, electric field compared with the uh, experiments. One application of it can be, for instance, in the description of the electrostatic discharge in devices. Again, the information about the high energy tail of the distribution is important when we want to describe, as mentioned before, the injection of hot carriers into the insulator. <laughs> Uh, I have shown the mobility analysis that was for the bulk situation, but we can repeat the analysis for the surface mobility. Surface mobility, besides being influenced by phonons impurities and the other factors that are present in the bulk, is also influenced by the uh, surface phonons and the surface roughness. In this figure, the dots represent uh, the results by Takagi that refer to the so-called universal mo surface mobility curves. The lines describe the simulations in the same, in the same conditions. Uh, the need of more sophisticated uh, methods of simulation is, of course, driven by the continuous shrinking of the devices. And uh, in this page, uh, there are a few uh, types of new effects that are listed. First of all, uh, when we consider devices that are very narrow, that is the lateral size of them is very much reduced. Then we have quantization effects. 
and uh, the main quantization effect is the formation of energy subbands. This is not included in the model in the models that I have described so far. Another issue is that when the length of the device becomes very small, it may happen that some of the colors do not have enough free flight for uh, undergoing a collision. So some of the colors may cross the, de the device in a collision free form that is the ballistic regime. This in turn may give rise to a large increase in the energy of the carriers so that uh, it may happen that the carriers have an energy that is not possible to describe anymore with the effective mass approximation. And finally, uh, since the uh, extension of the device is very small, we may also have tunneling either of the band to band type or of the source to drain type across the across the device and this needs more and more sophisticated tools for the description in the following i'm giving just one example before concluding the presentation that the example is related to a nanowire that works in the ballistic regime in the ballistic regime it is necessary to solve a system of two equations that are made of the Poisson equation and of the Schrodinger equation. Uh, in this type of device, due to the geometry, it is possible to separate the Schrodinger equation using the cylindrical coordinates. But it turns out that the latter solution is very expensive, also because it is coupled with the solution of the Poisson equation. So the number of nodes in the longitudinal direction that is Z in this example, must be kept as small as possible. So in the longitudinal direction, it is necessary to solve the Schrodinger equation with the, some type of numerical method that is more powerful than the standard box integration method. The method used here is called the number of process. And in these two figures, there is the description on the left of the electric potential, or sorry, the potential energy in the device. The two curves, red and black, refer to two different, different uh, voltages applied to the device. The horizontal lines refer to the total energy of, electron, of the electron. Uh, the figure on the right shows one of the two fundamental solutions of the Schrodinger equation. Of course, uh, the Schrodinger equation has a solution that is oscillating and the oscillations are coarser in the central part of the device because the potential energy is larger, so the kinetic energy is smaller. The uh, experimental the numerical experiment in this case was to detect the influence of the grid spacing on the solution. So we started with the grid made of about 1000 nodes. And the solution is that of the dots in the right figure. And then we decreased to 200, 100, and, and finally 50 nodes. And only the grid made of 50 nodes show some discrepancy that are the transversal little lines that are visible in the figure with respect to the uh, more elaborate solution with 1000 nodes. So this shows that uh, the numerical methods works well even with a small number of nodes. Uh, the talk practically finishes here. This figure that is uh, adapted from a figure of the handbook that I cited, shows that uh, when the mm, device size shrinks, it is possible to adopt uh, more elaborate methods. The names of some of them are indicated here. Of course, the method become more accurate physically more CPU demanding and more complex. 
so they become less and less suitable for applications in uh, uh, engineering problems or designing devices in companies. So they are of less practical use for engineering application, but they provide a better insight to the functioning of the device. To conclude, I think it has been a very, very fortunate situation for those who have been working in the last decades in this field because we have been witnessed the enormous improvement and development of this field. So I'm very happy to that I had the occasion to work in this field. More recently, the um, devices and uh, structures different from silicon have been investigated high KD electrics, graphene nanowares, or calcogenides for phase change memory applications. But in essence, the methods that I described in this presentation are applicable also to, to the investigation of these new materials and structures. So I wish to thank you very much for your attention and I conclude here. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rudan for covering, I suppose, the last uh, five decades of your research activity in this particular area. And there are a few questions which have been shared by the attendees in the chat section. I shall share my slides. I hope they are visible to you. Yes, so the, the first one is, can I comment about the scalability of the SHE method for BTA for carrying out complex simulations such as harmonic balance simulation? Uh, well, the uh, SHE method is based on the form of the Boltzmann transport equation that is called semi-classical because the, uh, it is assumed that the variation of the electric potential inside the device is of the external electric potential due to the non-uniformity of doping or to the application of the bias is much weaker than the variation of the atomic potential in the device. So um, for this reason, the equation is called semi-classical because the left-hand side is identical to that uh, the uh, uses for used for, for gases, for instance. Okay, so the uh, scalability is limited by this. Uh, if we have variations that are too strong, we cannot use that form of the equation anymore. Okay. Then uh, the second question is can the SHE method be used to realize the forming process in resistive lamps? Uh, I'm not expert of that, uh, but uh, if the conditions that I stated in answering question one are applicable, I think it should be applicable to that case. Uh, the other Question is, can the SHE method be used to model 2D material-based devices? Uh, I think that uh, it can be done, but uh, if the 2D situation comes from a shrinking, that is a real device that is very thin, then we should incorporate uh, the subband condition, the existence of subbands. If it is 2D because we just dispose of the third dimension due to the uniformity in the third dimension, of course, the answer is yes. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rudan. I think I have thank taken you. up all possible questions which have been shared in the chat section. Well, thank you very much for sparing your valuable time, sir. And on behalf of uh, uh, the IEEE Electron Device Society, Delhi Chapter, and the other co-organizers for this particular webinar. I would like to thank you. 
and to all the attendees who have been there with us today. And I invite all of you to attend our future webinars for which the Zoom link will be shared uh, automatically in subsequent days. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.